This Parsha podcast is sponsored by my dear friend Bill Cohn in loving memory and Leilu Nishmas Michal ben Shmuel and Yehudit, whose yard site falls out this week. May his soul be elevated in heaven. I am recording this from freezing, frigid, frosty Houston, Texas. As you know, Texas has experienced this week an unprecedented winter storm. We even got snow, and then we lost our power, and Tuesday we had no power, no heating, really no reception, no data, the water was a trickle. Of course, we were in great spirits, we just put on lots of layers, of course, as Texans we don't exactly have tons of winter paraphernalia, just add more sweaters, things were fine, and thank God this morning, Wednesday morning, the power was restored after 24 hours, isn't it great to be living in the energy capital of the world? Water is still a trickle, but our attitude is incredibly positive. And I must tell you, last night, they were talking about not having power restored for several days. And I was really worried about the Parsha podcast. What am I going to do if there is no power? How am I going to record the Parsha podcast? But my plan was that come what may, I was going to record a podcast. Even if I needed to record it by candlelight, the way they used to do it in the shtetl 150 years ago. I was going to record it. The recording apparatus is battery operated. How I was going to upload it was still a mystery, but I really wanted to do it. And as you know, there's a streak going on here. It's been 26 weeks in a row. Thank God that we were doing a new Parsha podcast. I was going to keep the streak alive. I must tell the audience that actually we did a Parsha podcast several months ago when our whole family had COVID. I figured if COVID doesn't stop, the Parsha podcast, nothing, not even a blackout is going to stop it. But thank God now, power is restored and here we go. Now, one quick note before we start. Usually I record it in the Torch Center, but the Torch Center doesn't have any heating. So I'm recording it in my home office. All of my children are up and I bribe them to keep quiet for the duration of the recording but we'll see how long that lasts. So if you hear some noises in the background, you'll please forgive me. This week is Parshas Teruma, and we are transitioning into a part of the Torah that deals with the tabernacle and all its vessels. And what I want to do today is to share with y'all three points regarding the Ark, the Aron, the first vessel that's mentioned in our Parsha. It is, of course, the vessel that is found in the total epicenter of the Mishkan and subsequently the temple. It's in the Holy of Holies. In it, it contains the actual tablets that Moshe got, both the first tablets that were smashed and the second tablets that endured. The only time it was ever visited was by the high priest, by the Kohen God, the An Yom Kippur. It is, of course, the holiest part of the temple. Now, there's a very nice piece by the Kliyaka where he shares the following idea. He notes, of course, the Talmud tells us, that there are three vessels in the tabernacle that have crowns around them. And they are the Aron, the Ark, which is symbolic of the crown of Torah. And then there's the Mizbeach, which is the altar, which is symbolic of the priesthood. And then there's the Shulchan, the table, which is symbolic of the monarchy. And the idea behind that is that there are three crowns that we have amongst our people. There is the crown of the monarchy, and that went to David. And there's the crown of the priesthood, and that went to Aaron and his descendants, of course. And then there's the crown of Torah, and that is symbolized by the Ark, and that is open for all. Now, the Kliarka points out something very interesting. If you look at the dimensions of these three respective vessels, you'll find an interesting pattern. The Ark, which is symbolic of Torah, is two and a half cubits, Amos, by one and a half by one and a half. So all of the measurements, all the sides... All of the dimensions are half, almost two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. And then you have the Mizbeach, the altar, which is symbolic of the priesthood. And those are all even numbers. One Amma, one cubit by one by two. And finally, you have the Shulch on the table, which is symbolic of the monarchy, which, of course, is about great wealth. And that has some like this and some like that. It's two Amos by one by one and a half. So why... By some of these vessels, are they even numbers? Some of them are a split. It's a mixed batch. Some are even and some are half numbers or fractions. And then when we talk about the Ark, which is symbolic of Torah, it's all half numbers. 
So he shares an interesting idea. He says that the priesthood, which is symbolic of the altar, that is there to bring perfection. And therefore the dimensions are all perfect, one by one by two. And he elaborates that there are, of course, two altars, the inner altar and the outer altar, the one of gold, the one of copper. Both of them are totally round numbers. And the inner altar, that's there to atone for the soul and for our spirit. And the outer altar is there to atone for our body, for our physicality. And therefore, this symbolizes perfection and atonement. And we come in incomplete and we leave complete and perfect and refined and fixed. And therefore, because we come to perfection via this particular vessel, via the Mizbech, the altar, therefore its dimensions are perfect as well. And then he tells us, well, what about the shulch on the table, which is symbolic of the monarchy and wealth? And there we see some of its sides are full numbers, two by one, and then the last one is by one and a half. Why is it a mixed batch? So he tells us that wealth has two properties. On one hand, we should feel complete. We should feel like we have everything we need. Because with respect to material well-being, that is a gift that we are given by God. And therefore, we should never feel like we're lacking. We have total round numbers, i.e. we're missing nothing, because everything that we need, we have. Every morning we say the blessing, Sha'asa Li called Sarki, the Almighty made for me everything I need. All my physical needs are present. I'm lacking nothing. But some of the dimensions are half numbers, are broken. And that symbolizes that we can never actually access all of our material desires. Of course, there's a famous teaching that if you have one, you want two. If you have two, you want four. A person does not die with half of their material desires accomplished. Because no matter what you have, you'll always feel like you have half and you'll never feel complete. And therefore, with respect to the wealth, we're told these two lessons. On one hand, you should feel like you're not lacking anything. On the other hand, if you do try to make this the focus of your life, you will always feel like you have a half. And finally, we get to the Ark. And the Ark is symbolic of Torah. And he tells us a very powerful lesson. He tells us that with respect to the Ark, every single side is a half. Two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. You're always lacking. With respect to Torah, with respect to wisdom, with respect to knowledge, the only way that we can accomplish something is if we feel a drive, a lack, a yearning for knowledge. Who is the one who is able to access wisdom? Someone who considers themselves lacking. We're told, who is the wise man? He who learns from everyone. If you feel like you know everything, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're not going to learn. You should find a different room. And specifically with respect to Torah, the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know and how much there is out there that you are lacking. We've told in the past, the Talmud, in the book of Yvamos, page 16a, it tells an amazing story about Rabbi Akiva. There was a massive debate about a given halachic matter. And there was an individual who everyone was terrified to debate And Rabbi Kiva encountered him. And this person said, I have 300 proofs that I'm right. And he starts to engage in this fierce debate with the great Rabbi Kiva. And Rabbi Kiva calmly and coolly is able to rebut all of his proofs. And this person was a great scholar, very sharp, very wily. He tells Rabbi Akiva, you're the famous Akiva whose name reverberates from one end of the world to the other end of the world. You are praiseworthy. You have earned a reputation. But you are no better than a shepherd of livestock. Rabbi Akiva responds to him, oh no, I am no better than a shepherd of sheep of smaller animals. 
When we read the story, it sounds like Robert Kiva is being so humble. The person is offending him. He is calling him names. You're no better than a shepherd of livestock. And Robert Kiva, in his humility, is saying, no, I'm even less. I'm even smaller. But my Rebbe, my teacher, of Asher Ayeli, used to say that there's a different point going on over here. Rabbi Kiva is displaying tremendous prowess at Torah greatness. The person has 300 proofs, and Rabbi Kiva is able to swat away all the proofs. He's a great Torah scholar. But the person tells him, compared to what Torah actually is, Torah, after all, is the Almighty's mind, his intellect. And therefore, just like the Almighty, Torah is infinite. And therefore, Rabbi Kiva, you have a great reputation, but ultimately, Torah is infinite, and therefore, your knowledge in Torah is akin to that of a shepherd. And Rabbi Kiva responds, Oh no, you have it wrong. Torah is even bigger than what you think, and therefore, my relative knowledge of Torah makes me only equal to that of a shepherd of smaller animals and not to a shepherd of livestock. Rabbi Kiva, of course, he is the one who could show us what it means to feel like you're lacking, what it means to be two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. You're not complete. You're all halves. You're all missing. There's so much out there that you don't know that you have to go pursue. And it's ironic that the people that know the least, they assume that they know the most. And Rabbi Kiva, who he is someone who knows the most relative to all his peers. He's the one who can show us really how much there is out there. Of course, this principle has been observed in science. It's known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. And of course, it's true with respect to education. It's, in my opinion, a real shame that many people stop learning, stop their education once their schooling is over. It's a shame that people stop learning at 22 or so. But especially with respect to Torah. In America, many bar mitzvah kids think they know it all in Torah. They've done their time, and now they can move on to bigger and better things. And here we see in our Parsha, the lesson, the Ark, which is symbolic of Torah. All sides, from all directions, from all vantage points, it is incomplete to tell us that we must view our knowledge of Torah as being incomplete, and only then will we be able to access more and more of the Almighty's wisdom. So that's the first observation I wanted to share with you. Let's get to the second observation, and that is as follows. We know the Ark was a box, and inside the box, there was another box, and inside the second box was a third box. There were three nested boxes within each other, wood in the middle, and then it is sandwiched by gold, and inside the container, inside the box, Moshe is told to put the tablets of the testimony, and the Talmud tells us it's both the tablets that were broken, the first tablets, tablets 1.0, and it was also the second tablets, the one that were the ones that were not broken. So we read in chapter 25, verse 16, Venasata el ha'aron, you shall place inside the ark the testimony, i.e. the Torah, that I will give you. And then, the verse pivots talking about the cherubs. On top of the ark, there is a cover. On top of the cover, you have hewn two cherubs that are like hugging each other. And then we read 25, 21, five verses after we read that in the ark you put the Torah, we read the following verse. And you should place the cover with the cherubs, of course, on top of the ark. And inside the ark, you shall place the testimony, i.e. the Torah, that I shall give you. And Rashi, of course, asked the question, I don't understand why is this repeated? Five verses earlier told us already that we shall place the Torah inside the ark. Why is it repeated? And Rashi tells us the answer is that before you put the cover on top, you must already insert the Torah, i.e. the tablets, inside of it. Don't say, oh, you know what? Let me put the cover on and then remove the cover and put the Torah in. No, you put the Torah in first, and then you put on the cover. That's what Rashi says. Now, there's an interesting maharal over here. And he gives a different answer to this question. He says that there's two aspects over here. We have the ark, and we have the cover. And both of them have a relationship 
with the testimony, i.e. with the Torah, with the tablets that are inside the Ark and underneath the cover. And you should not get the impression that this is one vessel. Oh no, this is two separate vessels. There's one vessel called the Ark, the Aron, and then there's a second vessel called the Kaporas, the cover, with the Kruvim, with the cherubs on top. Don't make them say they are one vessel. Oh no, they're two vessels, and each one of them has a relationship with the tablets. The Ark must hold the tablets. It must be the receptacle for the tablets. And then there is the cover for the tablets, and that is the cover, i.e. the Kaporas. I want to suggest that maybe there's a very valuable lesson for us over here. From the perspective of the tablets, the Torah, it needs two things. It needs to have a receptacle. It needs to have an ark in which it can be placed. And it also needs a cover. It needs the kaporas, which goes on top of it, the kaporas that has the cherubs. The Talmud tells us that the ark is symbolic of the Torah scholar. And just like the ark from inside and outside is plated in gold, so too a true Torah scholar must be golden inside and golden outside. Torah needs a golden receptacle, a righteous person for Torah to dwell in. Number one. Number two, Torah also needs to be covered. It needs to be hidden. It needs to have the modesty, so to speak, of a cover, of a lid placed on top of it so no one else could see it. There's two necessary components for Torah. Before Torah can ever be done, can ever be accepted, absorbed by a person, the person, i.e., the ark, if you will, in this example, has to have golden character. Our sages tell us, derech heretz, good character, ethics, character refinement, precedes Torah. Before you have Torah, you must have the golden ark, gold inside and gold outside. But what about after the Torah is already inside the ark? What then? Could we parade around town with our Torah, so to speak, exposed to all to see? Oh no. We have to cover it. We have to hide it. We have to cover our accomplishments and not let anyone see them. And this is the idea of modesty. The prophet Micah tells us that there are three things that God wants from us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk with modesty before God. Modesty is one of the central pillars of our faith, of our religion, of what we are supposed to do. Our sages tell us that when something is hidden, it has blessing. When something is revealed, it is precluded from having blessing. Example the Talmud gives is that if someone prays after they count their money, that's a false prayer. That's not a fair prayer. You already counted your money. It's already something which is not hidden. It is revealed. You can't pray because there's no longer a portal for blessing. Whereas if someone does not know exactly how much money they have, and then they pray for blessing, then because it's hidden, there is the opportunity for blessing to rest upon the person's assets. Another example. When Torah is hidden, when Torah is modestly covered up, it endures. The Midrash tells us that the Jewish people got two sets of tablets. The first set of tablets were given at Sinai, and there were millions of people who were there for the ceremony, and there was lots of pomp and circumstance, and there was fire, and there was clouds and thick clouds and terrifying noises. It was done publicly. And how'd that work out? The first tablets were shattered. It was not done in a modest fashion. 
it didn't endure. And when God said, let's have a second tablets, let's have tablets 2.0, let's have this second opportunity, a redux for the tablets. He told Moshe, I want you to do this modestly. I don't want anyone to know about it. And then they can endure. Torah, for it to endure, it's not enough to be righteous, good character, golden inside and outside to endure. It has to also be covered. It has to also be modest. No one else needs to see. No one else needs to know. Keep it to yourself. Talmud tells us that there are three things that a Torah scholar is allowed to lie about. This is in the Talmud Book of Bamatsiya, page 23b, going into 24a. And it tells us there are three things that a Torah scholar is allowed to lie about. Number one, Torah study. Number two, matters of intimacy. Number three, matters of hospitality. Meaning, if you ask a Torah scholar, hey, tell me about this and this people that you stayed by, your hosts. So if you say, well, they're so giving and so benevolent and they prepare lavish meals, everyone's going to go knocking on the door seeking out more of that hospitality. And therefore you're allowed to lie and you're allowed to kind of diminish how good they were in order to prevent them from having a long line of people coming to get some of their generosity. And again, we read that with respect to Torah, the same is true. If someone asks you, how much do you know? Or if someone asks you a question and you really know the answer, train yourself to say, I don't exactly know so much. I don't know the answer to this question. You don't need to flaunt it. Because if you do flaunt it, like the first set of tablets, it's not going to endure. There's another amazing midrash that compares Torah to precious gems in that you have to hide them. If you have Precious gems, you put them in a box, in a safe, in a safety deposit box. You take the key and you hide the key. The more precious something is, the more we hide it. With respect to our spiritual accomplishments, the same is true. They're precious. They're very precious. And therefore, we have to conceal them. And if we flaunt them, if we try to publicize them, they're going to fizzle away and we're going to lose them. So maybe this is the lesson here. There's two parts, there's two components to have the testimony, to have the tablets inside this ark. Number one, of course, like the Talmud says, you have to be golden inside and outside. You have to have good character. You have to be refined before you could be a receptacle for Torah. Moreover, you have to have a cover. You have to have modesty No one needs to know all of your greatness. And that is the way the Torah can endure within you. In fact, the verse says that from between the cherubs, from the cover, in effect, of the Torah, that is where God communicates to Moshe. Our connection, so to speak, to the Almighty is done specifically in our capacity to conceal, to cover our greatness. That determines what kind of relationship we have with the Almighty. Very powerful insight. And finally, point number three that I want to share with y'all today comes from the cherubs as well. The Talmud in the book of Baba Basra, page 99a, tells us that the orientation of these cherubs was determined by the nation's relationship with the Almighty. If we were righteous, if we were close to God, then God was close to us. And the two cherubs, one symbolizing the Jewish nation, and one symbolizing God, we're facing each other, we're embracing each other. God forbid, when our nation went away from the Almighty, then these two cherubs would reflect that and they would swivel away from each other and display, so to speak, their dissatisfaction with each other and their distance from each other. That's the Talmud, the book of Bava Basra, page 99a. The Talmud elsewhere, in the book of Yoma, page 54a, tells us that during the festivals, they would open the partition, open the curtain, and everyone would be able to see inside the Holy of Holies, and they would see the cherubs that were 
clinging to each other, that were hugging each other. And the nation will be so happy. Look and see how much the Almighty loves us, almost like the love of a young boy and a young girl for each other. That's the Talmud Book of Yoma, page 54a. And here's my question. Talmud tells us that during the festivals, they would open the curtain and see what's going on behind the curtain, see what the orientation of the cherubs currently is. Why is this done only during the festivals? Why do we open it up every day, for example, so we get a peek to see how we're doing today? Maybe we could suggest the following. We're supposed to periodically check out, assess what our relationship with God is. But we're not supposed to obsess over it every day. Every couple of months, on the festival, we take our temperature, we do a little stress test, if you will, of our relationship with the Almighty, see where we are holding. But that is not something we have to stress about every single day. Of course, every single day is supposed to connect to the Almighty as much as possible. Do the mitzvos, pray, study Torah, but not to always think, okay, where exactly am I holding? Not to, not to every day try to map our progress along some chart to see how we're doing. It's almost like the, you know, stocks. If you check your stocks every five seconds or every minute, you get really nervous. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. The smart investors know that's not how you do it. Maybe every month, maybe every couple of months, you look out. And then, of course, once you zoom out, you see that generally the stocks go up. And therefore, that's what you want. But if you look at it too closely, it could be perhaps a little bit unsettling because an upward trajectory is a series of ups and downs. But hopefully, the general direction is ascendant. And I think it's also interesting that we're told that this is something we do in the festivals. Perhaps that's one of the roles of the festivals. The role of the festival is each festival is oriented around a different part of our relationship with the Almighty. And we're supposed to focus and test, so to speak, where we are holding in that particular area. Every festival, perhaps, is another test of our spiritual standing. My grandfather used to always say, that the great Rabbi Israel Salanter would say that Purim is a test for the spirituality of our body. We're supposed to get drunk, so drunk that we have no control. It's just our body acting. And of course, our body has all these desires. And when we're sober, we have inhibitions. And that's a good thing. And then you get totally drunk and the body goes wild. If you want to see, if you want to gauge the holiness, the spirituality of your body, you get super drunk on Purim, a festival, of course, that is upcoming next week for us. You get super drunk on Purim, and that's a good test for the spirituality of your body. I would surmise that every festival has its particular area of our spiritual dashboard, our spiritual portfolio that we need to focus, we need to assess, we need to pull open the curtains and see how the ark is doing, but not something you think about every single day that will just drive you insane. So there you have it. Three thoughts, three points behind the ark. Now the truth is, I actually had a fourth thought, but I was told by our marketing guru that whenever you do a list, it always has to be an odd number. You could do the one most important thing, the three most important things, five things, seven things, but never, ever, ever, ever do an even number. And who am I to argue with the experts? I'm not going to argue with the experts. So there you go. Three points, three thoughts on the arc and not four. And if you are disappointed with that, if you feel like you've been cheated from the fourth thought, you can email me. We'll file a complaint with our marketing team, email me, rabbalwajima.com. Okay, let's get to this week's A and Q. Well, what's A and Q? A and Q stands for answers and questions. But Rabbi, isn't it supposed to be questions and answers? Yes. Generally speaking, everyone else to do questions and answers. But us at Torch, we don't do questions and answers. We do answers and questions. I'm going to present you with a question. And it's your job, if you would like, of course, it's not mandatory, it's optional. If you would like, you could think about the question. And if you come up with a great answer, 
or even an average answer, send it to me, rabbiwobajim.com. So here's this week's question. In our partial, we read about the menorah. The menorah, of course, is the candelabra. It's got seven stems, or really three branches coming out of either side of a central stem. And that is what was lit in the Mishkan and subsequently the temple. Now, Rashi tells us that it was made in an unusual fashion. In verse 40, we read that God tells Moshe, you should see it, and then you should make it. Says Rashi, that Moshe had a hard time visualizing what the menorah looked like. And he wasn't able to make it. And the Almighty showed him, the Almighty superimposed, so to speak, a menorah, a candelabra of fire. The Almighty projected it onto the mountain. And Moshe was able to see what it looked like. And I made the joke in the past. Even today, Jews are not known for their visual spatial intellect. It makes sense. Moshe needed to see the image of the menorah before he could make it. That's Rashi in verse 40. Rashi in verse 31 tells us a different thing that happened. The menorah shall be made, is the words of the verse. And Rashi tells us it was made on its own. Moshe didn't make it, even Betzal didn't make it. It was made on its own. Because Moshe had such a hard time with the menorah. And then he says, you know what? Just take all the gold and throw it into a fire, and it will be made on its own. It will be made miraculously. And therefore the verse says, it shall be made, not you shall make it. So here's the question. If Moshe was anyhow going to rely on a miracle for making the menorah, why does God have to show him this fiery image of a menorah projected onto the mountain? Clearly, this is too difficult for Moshe to make. So what does he do? He throws the hunk of gold into the fire and lets God make it. But that's not what happened. The Almighty first showed Moshe a detailed image of a fiery menorah projected onto the mountain. And still Moshe was unable to make it himself. So the Almighty said, okay, you can't make it. I'll make it. Throw it into the fire. And let me make it. Why go through all the trouble of showing it to him, of making the menorah fire on the mountain, if anyhow Moshe is not going to be able to make it? Of course, it's a very bizarre way of making a menorah. But if ultimately you're going to just rely on this miracle from God, have Moshe just chuck it all into a fire and whatever comes out, the menorah that God makes, that is what we will use. So if you have an answer to this question as to why the Almighty first showed Moshe the picture, the image of the menorah made out of fire, if ultimately Moshe anyhow wasn't able to make it even after he had that assistance, if you have an answer, email me. Rabbi Walby at gmail.com. Let's get to last week's question. And our question was, the Talmud tells us, that when the Jewish people said, Nas, have an we will do and we will listen. An angel came to every one of the 600,000 Jewish souls that were there and placed two crowns atop the heads of every Jew. But 40 days later, when the nation commits a sin, the grievous sin, the unconscionable sin of the golden calf, 1.2 million angels came and removed the 1.2 million crowns. Every angel removed a single crown. And the question is, why can one angel deliver two crowns, but you need two angels to remove those two very same crowns? So, of course, the Parsha podcast audience, nay, the Parsha podcast family did not disappoint not this week, not any week that we've had the A and Q challenge. And we've got all kinds of answers. And three of them had some version of the following answer, which I think is totally spot on. And that is that God is more compassionate and more rewarding than he is punishing. And therefore, the rewarding angel who is delivering the crowns is more powerful than the punishing the angel who is removing those crowns. And therefore, the rewarding angel who is stronger is able to deliver and, so to speak, take care of two crowns, whereas the punishing angel is weaker, comparatively, and therefore is only able to deal with one crown apiece, one crown at a time. 
And one of the reasons why I love this answer is because this answer is actually found in the Ben Yehoyad, and he gives three somewhat related answers. The first answer is that idea that the Almighty's attribute of reward and compassion and kindness is stronger, so to speak, than his attribute of judgment. It's almost like the right and the left hand. The right hand symbolizes kindness and mercy and compassion and benevolence. And the left hand, which is weaker, that corresponds to judgment. And then he gives a little bit of a Kabbalistic twist to this answer. And he says that when you have a good angel, a rewarding angel, his right hand, so to speak, and his left hand are both kindness. And therefore, in the right hand, the angel can take a crown. And in the left hand, the angel can also take a crown. And therefore, the angel could carry two crowns because a good angel, so to speak, the right hand and the left hand are both that of kindness. But a bad angel, a punishing angel, cannot do judgment in his right hand, so to speak, only in his left hand, and therefore is capable of transporting only one crown at a time. And this idea, of course, is found elsewhere in Jewish literature. Our sages tell us that God is 500 times more kind than he is punishing. And finally, I want to end off with one more answer from the Ben Yehoyada. And this actually was said to me by my good friend Pat, and that is that with the sin of the golden calf, it created a rift between the na'aseh and the nishma, between we shall do and we shall listen. And he adds that there's a principle that one angel is only capable of one mission. You cannot send one angel to do two separate unrelated missions. And therefore, with the installation of the crowns, because the Na'as and the Nishma, the we will do, we will listen, were fused together by the Jewish people, it was akin to being only one crown. And therefore, you needed only one angel to deliver these two crowns because they were fused together. But the sin of the golden calf created a division, a bifurcation of the Na'as and the Nishma. Therefore, the crowns were almost separated. And therefore, it was two separate missions to remove those crowns, and consequently, you needed two separate angels. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed as much as we did. I hope if you happen to be in the state of Texas, you are happy and healthy and safe and warm. And if you don't have power, it comes back to you really quickly. And wherever you are in the country, in the world, I hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of the Parsha Podcast. Have an amazing Shabbos. And take care. Please, God, we will talk next week.